There's a, uh, a well-known uh, quotation, and, and perhaps uh, you've heard it before. Uh, the quotation is, a ship in harbor is safe. But that's not what ships are built for. This saying that probably goes back to the 1920s or so has been applied to all kinds of, of conditions and challenges. And whether used in reference to a company or a restaurant menu or our own personal lives, the meaning of this quotation is generally the same. As human beings, we're wise to remember to move along in life and not get stuck, to be willing to take risks and to go out on a limb. And understand that if we insist on continually staying put and not changing a darn thing, our potential can never be fulfilled. Now, we can likely think of numerous examples of when someone or something played it too safe, and opportunities were not only lost, but the future itself became bleak as a result. Blockbuster, Sears, The Pullman Company, Woolworth, Borders, Kodak. They stayed in safe harbor, and they are gone, or certainly nearly gone. And just like these examples, how many of you, this will date us, but how many of you remember well or had a product produced by the Smith Corona Company? They played it so safe they lost sight of reality. In the 1990s, the CEO of the company said, quote, many people believe that the typewriter and word processor business is a buggy whip industry. They are very wrong. As human beings, we were not created to stay in safe harbors throughout our lives, but made to, to venture out into the wild and risky wide open sea. We're made to ride large swells, have salty spray hit our faces, and we're equipped by God to make it through stormy passages. It's evident to me that our Creator often calls us to head out and go, to move beyond what we can see or predict or know, and to live our lives with a continual spirit of adventure, curiosity, and wonder. Now, before I get more into this, I need to offer a few remarks, a, a caveat, if you will, to keep in mind, in response to what I've just said, and in response to what I will say shortly. So the caveat to all of this. When I was a young boy in El Paso, Texas, one day I was walking through our neighborhood. It was a hot, dry summer day. And as I made my way through the neighborhood, I looked ahead and I saw a strange object in the street. And when I got closer, I discovered a rather large desert snapping turtle. On its back, with its legs frantically waving around. Well, knowing that this turtle could easily die in this position, I, of course, picked the turtle up and placed it right side up on a lawn that was nearby. And after the turtle had recovered, I decided to take him home to our own backyard. <laughs> Where over the years, in fact, he became a very close friend and a connoisseur of ground sirloin. <laughs> now, I don't know if he was a he or a she, but I named this desert snapping turtle Snappy. And as I think back to Snappy and his life with me, and as I think back to the day that I found him on that street, it seems that many, if not all of us, have been in the position I found him in that day so long ago. Periods in our lives in which we have felt like everything is turned upside down. Whether due to sickness or unemployment or living well beyond a spouse, dealing with the vestiges of his old age, death, loss, some huge life transition, managing the mania associated with a growing family that's going in a million directions, or just plain old heartache. To live means that we are going to be turned upside down sometimes. To be human means there are those passages we find ourselves in positions we don't like. Circumstances that make us scared, frantic, sad, worried, confused, or happenings that may even cause us just like we want to be done with it all. I've been there, each of you has been there, or maybe today, and I get it. 
And when we are in such places, sometimes what we need most to do is to grab on to what is familiar, turn to what we know, rest in what has been, relax in the presence of others like a warm blanket on a cold day. Sometimes we just need to eat that food that we've eaten for years or to hear that old hymn or to sit in a chair that has become shaped to fit who we've become. Or we need to go to that one street in town that has not changed so much and take a walk. Or we need to reminisce or pull out an old album or turn to the pages of a scrapbook or take a long nap or take a drive down a familiar road or write a letter by hand or simply journey back in time in our minds and remain there as long as we need to. Said another way, I want to be very clear, while we may be ships that are made to be out on the water, sometimes we just need to go to a safe harbor and stay for a while. And not only is that okay, but it can be exactly what God wants us to do. It's why Jesus one day said to a crowd, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Stillness, peace, familiarity, a sense of security, resting, docking in a protected marina may be where we need to be for a while. And I need to be clear, that is okay. So with that in mind, that essential caveat in mind, I want to go back to this idea that we were not meant to spend our lives in safe harbor, but to get out onto the open sea. And to help us begin to do this, I'd like first to turn very briefly to our Gospel of Mark and to take, look, take a look at what's known as the story of the transfiguration. Here's a bit of its context. Jesus and his disciples are together. They're in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus says, who do you think that I am? And Peter says, well, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, that's right, Peter. Jesus then says, and by the way, there's going to be a time not too far from now when they're going to kill me. The disciples are not very happy about that prediction. And it is six days after this that Jesus takes his followers, arguably his closest followers, Peter, James, and John, with him up a big mountain. And it's there on the mountain that he is transfigured. It means his appearance totally changed. He suddenly looks like something nobody has ever seen before. And then it's at that moment that Jesus is gleaming whiter than bleach. And Moses and Elijah all of a sudden appear. Now, to Peter, James, and John, who were Jews, to see Moses would have reminded them about everything the Scriptures had said. To see the prophet Elijah would have reminded them of everything all the prophets had said. They would have known this is a really big deal. And while they may not have gotten it at the moment, the presence of Moses, the presence of Elijah, was confirmation that this Jesus is Messiah, is God in the flesh. Needless to say, Peter, James, and John are blown away. They don't know what to make of the whole thing. We're told by Mark that Peter was afraid. I'm sure he felt more than fear. And it's in the midst of his confusion, he says, uh, let's build something, let's put up some tents. I suppose he felt he had to say something. And while the story may sound very bizarre to us 2,000 years later, and while I have yet to meet a person who has seen a gleaming white Jesus on a hillside, what is clear is that the transfiguration was all about showing the world at the time who Jesus really is. Now what happens next is interesting. Rather than sitting down and taking some time to debrief his companions, Jesus says, oh, by the way, don't tell anybody that you've seen this until after I've been risen from the dead, and now let's go. And not only must Peter and his friends have been confused by Jesus saying risen from the dead as they could not possibly have known what on earth that meant, but they certainly must have wanted to sit down with Jesus and taken some time to figure things out what just happened, Jesus? What, 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 what is this? What does this mean? But Jesus doesn't lay anything out. He doesn't explain what happened in any concrete way. He doesn't engage in a question and answer period. Instead, he says to the confused followers, let's get going. 
Now, what's interesting to me is that this is yet just another example of what we find throughout the Old and the New Testaments. God has his habit, and sometimes upsetting habit, sometimes annoying habit, sometimes frustrating habit, of saying to people in the midst of whatever's going on, move on, let go, get going, don't stay where you are right now, don't stay put, time for a new chapter in life, it's time for you to grow, time to change, time to loosen your grip, stop thinking so much, just get going and act, you need to get going, go! And in fact, with just two letters, you can sum up a key plot line of what God says in the Bible. G-O, go! And there's so many examples of this all over Scripture. Here are just some snippets, little tiny snippets. Remember a guy named Jeremiah? I really like being young. He says to God, I'm only a boy. I kind of like this. God says, Jeremiah, you may want to stay young. You may say you're a boy, but I'm saying to you, get up, grow up, and get going. And then there was a widow. We don't know her name. She didn't have anything to eat. She was very poor. She had a son to care for. Elijah approaches this widow that has nothing and says, give me something to eat. She says, I don't have anything. He says, give me what you have right now in your pockets and then go home. God will take care of you. Peter one evening, remember the story of Peter? He's out on the Sea of Galilee in a massive and wind-driven storm. He's flipped out. He's hunkering down in the boat. Jesus comes walking across the water. Peter, what are you hunkering down for? Come on, get out. Come on. Or how about the day that a man's following Jesus and his disciples on a road? The man says, Jesus, I want to follow you, but i got to take care of some things first. Jesus says, that's not the way it works. Let's get going right now. Or how about in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament? Something, a series of verses we don't pay much attention to. It's called the Sabbath year arrangement. Every seven years... People were supposed to forgive all their debts. No more debt. Just think, your mortgage is gone every six to seven years. And on top of that, you're supposed to free all your slaves. In other words, God says, every seven years, let go of it all, begin again, start over. How about on the first morning, the Easter morning? Jesus had been raised from the dead. Women, including several, call Mary run into the risen Jesus. They grab onto his feet. They cling to him. And Jesus says, get up, get going. Go tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. So he meets the disciples. There's not much discussion. There's not much reminiscing. Jesus says, get up and go and share the world, share the news with the world. So if you take these stories along with the huge numbers of others like them, God often says, let go, loosen your grip, and go. What's interesting is that if you look at all the stories, God sends this message to people despite youth, despite old age, despite lack of experience, despite low confidence, feeling tied down, trapped, or burdened despite piles of unanswered questions, despite fear, regardless of long-held ways of looking at things or temperament or skill sets or even degree of faith. And so while it's crystal clear this is a central biblical theme, I, I believe that we're compelled to explore and ask what it is that we might take away from this theme. Said another way, What might God be saying to you this morning and to me? Go. Let go. Every single one of us today here holds on to some things. Ways of being. Looking at things. All of us cling and grasp and grip. Some of them may be okay. But as followers of Jesus, I believe it's imperative we regularly ask ourselves day in and day out, to what end and to what purpose are we clinging? Why do I insist on this, whatever this might be? Why do I require that, whatever that might be? 
Why is this way of looking at dot, 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 dot so important? Why do I hold so tightly to dot, 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 dot? What is it that makes me feel safe and secure? Where is this need to clench onto this coming from? Our answers may help us embrace not only what is helpful and cause us to be more faithful, but may help us, in fact, live much more joyously and fully. But our answers to such questions may help us realize that there's some things, some ways of being, some ways of thinking, some ways of living we need to release. We need to let go of in order to flourish. Now, don't get me started on the whole subject of tradition, but before that, I just need to be very clear. Tradition is really important, and I embrace a lot of traditions. Traditions can be good, and certainly we don't change for the sake of change, and God calls us to change across many dimensions of life, including when it comes to the church. And traditions have been such a blessing and a curse, but some have been gripped almost to the point of causing the end of churches. Do you know that tradition said, don't put the Bible in the language people can understand? It was clung on to for a long time. For God's sakes, don't let people know what God has to say. Tradition said, you have to have a priest or a church to mediate your relationship with God. Tradition said, blacks are not equal. Certainly, women should be subservient and never a pastor in a position of leadership in any capacity. What are our sacred cows when it comes to our church life? Which ones are truly sacred? And which ones are essentially cows that God would prefer we put into pasture? And, but aside from this, most if not all of us here have experienced great and wonderful and superb blessings in life, just as God intends. But are there things in your life that remain that remain long past their designated shelf life. God calls us past fear and into the unknown and into something entirely different, new chapters in life, but that can be equally good and wonderful and life-giving. That's why it's critical for us to continually ask, where am I stagnating? Where am I stuck? What am I resisting? What is it in my life I have a sense that I need to let go of and move on and move beyond? So I believe that God is pretty clear with us. There are times to go to a safe harbor and remain a while. And there are times to head out into the open sea. But in general, I believe God is clear that he wants our lives to be lives of adventure, to head out, to move on to let go and to grow. We're not made for inertia in any area of life. And we certainly are not made for stagnation in an ever-changing and deepening and transforming dynamic relationship with God. You see, the more willing we are to let go, the more room we make for God to act in our lives. So I began this morning by sharing this quotation a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. What a brilliant metaphor to pay attention to that's inherently biblical. As I said, God calls us to live our lives out to sea, where our lives are moving, changing, causing us to wonder and explore, lives that instill within us a sense of, of joyous curiosity and adventure a willingness to embrace what is new and different, unique, and previously unknown, a life in which we flex and morph and bend and grow and flow, not rigidity. But sometimes we need a break, as I've said repeatedly, and it might just be then that we need a safe harbor, not one that is permanent, not one we hunker down in for per perpetuity, but rather a place to be still and to rest. So when it's all said and done, just to finish up, I think the message this morning is for each of us to pay attention and to wake up and to open up our eyes about our own lives and to spend the energy again and again and again and again figuring out where our ships need to be. 
Do you need to head out to sea right now and let go of something? Do you need to come in and take some time and safe harbor? Are there different parts of your life that may need to come in and may need to go out? Is it time to head in or to head out? But regardless of where you are, regardless of how you answer these questions, how wherever you are, we're struggling with all of this stuff, remember this. God is in every safe harbor. God is out on every open sea. And God is waiting for you and for me over the horizon in a world we yet have to see. And let us take a few moments and pray with Paul.